My name is David Talbi, this is my colleague Claudio Branzan, and we are going to talk to you today about extracting semantic information from free text clinical notes. So the, the set of problems or applications we are working on are, are very, very diverse, and basically uh, every time you're looking to uh, understand anything interesting about patients, so who is at risk uh, to get pep, uh, sepsis, who is at risk for um, uh, you know, a risky uh, delivery, uh, who is at risk for hospital-acquired infection, who fits a specific a clinical trial. Basically, you need to understand the history of the patient, and most of it is captured in free text notes that are highly unstructured. So the first thing you need to be able to do is analyze those, the, the set of notes and be able to ask queries. So I'm, I'm a fit for a specific clinical trial. If I'm a, at a certain set of cancer, it's the first time I'm there, I'm not pregnant, I've not started chemo, and there's sort of other criteria. So, so let's see how we start uh, answering those queries correctly. So the, the first thing that, that as an in industry we tried and, and worked beautifully 10, 15 years ago uh, was search. And we indexed documents. And uh, we had a nice query language. And we were, we were able to ask about keywords and the conjunctional keywords. And we had some tricks with language we could apply. And that worked much better than reading every document by hand. And when we did it, we, we, started, we spent a lot of time talking about how we build uh, inverted indexes, uh, how we build rankers, how we do boosting for the reputation on the source or number of links uh, or, or user feedback. And, uh, and, and that all advanced. And that worked very well uh, when we knew which keywords we were looking for. Uh, but it's not enough because uh, if, if I'm looking at, uh, uh, at, at something like you know, diabetes or something like depression, uh, basically, all of us are going to have those keywords within our clinical notes. Either we have it or we don't have it, but we get tested on it, or somebody asks us about it. And every time we go and, and we look, especially within a specialty or, or subspecialty, basically all of the major keywords are going to be there, because there are standard tests uh, that happen every time. So we had to go one step further. And then the next thing we tried was looking at what's called semantic search. So if I'm looking for a you know, cheap red prom dress, uh, by the way, all of these queries in Google US would give you, would give you good results. So I know uh, that red is a color. I know that cheap relates specifically to prom dress, right? So cheap dresses and cheap watches uh, and cheap pencils are not the same thing. Uh, I know that prom dress relates to an event, a type of an event, right? And, and obviously, I would get dresses that have really none of, none of, none of those keywords in the results. Similarly, I want uh, my search engine to understand context. Right, so especially if I'm talking about food, if I'm talking about uh, music, movies, sports events, I, I want to know what's happening right now, what I can get right now, what's happening next to me. And, and all of that uh, really requires just very good query understanding. So I need to parse the query. I need to classify to a specific category and then understand um, in each and every word, mostly dictionary based. When we get to, uh, more, to harder domains like healthcare, uh, then you really need to be able to understand the grammar of a specific language. Uh, so we get to a point where it's really critical to understand the difference between uh, you know, Jane has disease X, Jane does not have it, Jane complains about symptoms that indicate X, uh, Jane is concerned about having X, Jane definitely does not have X, or Jane probably does not have X. And those are clinically very, very different things. So having the suspicion of something, having positive tests about something, having symptoms that may indicate something, are clinically very, very different things. If you go into specific specialties, I need to be able to differentiate between uh, uh, current symptoms and, and chronic, so things that have, have been happening for a long time. Uh, I need to be able to uh, understand really in what order I need to do certain tests. Uh, and this all requires uh, really very specifically understanding the grammar uh, of every sentence. Uh, other things that, that I need to be able to do here, I need to understand the subject of a sentence, because I'll be talking about uh, different people. So I need to understand whether uh, something is happening to me or something is a family history. I need to understand also uh, the difference between present and past. So things between uh, what's happening to me now and the fact that I was diagnosed with something when I was you know, 15 years old or two years ago. Once you get into language, things do get complex in two ways. First of all, language itself gets complex. Okay, so as you can see from the examples here, uh, if Joe was concerned about the risk of bird flu, there is nothing here about flu. Okay, so this is not, you know, it does not have flu, it does not not have flu. Uh, this is a completely separate context we are talking about. Uh, we need to be able to uh, deal with compound sentences. We need to be able to deal with sentences that have double negations. We need to uh, be able to deal with different, uh, many, many different ways that people find to express uh, that things happen to people or things do not happen to people. A few months into this project, we were at the point where we had over 100 grammatical patterns to say that a patient does not have something. 
and it has grown significantly. And really one of the most interesting, interesting aspects of working on this set of problems is just the huge variety in human language uh, that you have to tackle. Uh, but that's problem number one. Problem number two is that sometimes you really need to understand the domain and just even grammar itself will not help you. So for example, when a doctor writes a patient denies alcohol abuse, this is really a synonym for I suspect alcohol abuse. Right? That's the only reason to write something like that in a, in a clinical note. Uh, when someone writes allergies, colon, pen penicillin, dust, sneezing, uh, we do not think that the patient is allergic to sneezing. Right? We, think that, uh, we also don't think the patient is actually sneezing right now. This is why he or she came to the office. Uh, we think it's a, a, it's a symptom, and we also think it's a symptom for dust, not penicillin, because just, that's just common knowledge. So uh, in both of these cases, knowledge of grammar will not help you. And, and going even one step further, all of these examples are easy, really easy because those are actually valid English. I mean, if you ask your English teacher, they'll tell you, yes, you know, this is a, these are sentences. In many cases, we, we look at the clinical note and more, and then more than half of the sentences are just not in English, uh, which means that uh, when you get to, to, to solving these problems and you start applying, uh, mostly, you know, we started like everyone, we started with open source uh, frameworks and annotators and being a lot of work on language. Uh, they fail miserably, even at the very basic concepts of trying to identify section, trying to un uh, identify sentences, trying to know who the sentence is about, because of uh, not just lack of, because of lack of domain specificity, but it comes across both the uh, vocabulary as well as uh, the grammar and how people talk and what they, what they mean when they do so. So here's what we're going to show you today. And by the way, what we did, we built a set of notebooks. They are freely available. And our goal was uh, to take really open, uh, only open source uh, solutions, build a, cert, um, build a set of free resources that you, know, you, you can play with. So you can start with a reference architecture and some examples and build from there. So we start with a Mimic data set. It's um, generally publicly available. You have to sign a privacy agreement, but it's a publicly available set of 30,000 uh, notes from the uh, ICU, intensive care. So intensive care is interesting because you have many different types of things that happen to people, unfortunately. Uh, afterwards, the processing pipeline is Spark, and on top of Spark, we use UEMA, really, as a language pipeline. And Cloud will show in a minute uh, what annotations are and what semantic facts we actually extract using UEMA. Uh, and then, usually, what you need to do, uh, you need to filter in whatever facts, semantic facts you extracted uh, into, into at least two types of databases. And one of them is more of a, da a batch database where you apply, you know, apply machine le learning, you apply other batch oriented analytics. And you'd also want, usually for applications, right, they actually want to ask real-time questions or be, be part of a clinical workflow, uh, you'll also want to pull it uh, into a, either a NoSQL database or is the example here and the example in the notebooks we put together, Elasticsearch, so that you can really ask semantically, start with simple questions, show me all the patients that have a disease uh, or that do not have this side effect even though they're on this drug, they have to much more complex stories about you know, fit to clinical trials and so on. Uh, so with that, I'm going to hand off to Claudio uh, to show uh, the first example notebook. Okay, so what we have here is a clinical note out of the MIMIC data set. If you look at it, you see that indeed it has the ugly structure that we talked about. Most of these things are not even sentences or just lists of things, whatever the doctor found. Um, and uh, what we're trying to do here is use UEMA, which is an open source available Java-based framework essentially, to create a set of annotators to extract information out of this unstructured data. And that's a precursor for doing any form of machine learning or anything that you want to do with this uh, data set. Uh, so if you're looking at some of the very basic annotators that we have here, things like uh, sentence detectors, right? You can see some of the sentences being detected here. And, uh, you know, section headers. This is an important piece and I'll get back to it in a second. Uh, but, you know, if you look at it, it's just words that appear somewhere in this document. And it's very critical to identify what actual uh, section is this because, and not only to identify it, but to normalize to some cementing types, like in, in this case, impression, just this word that appears here, uh, delineates, if you want, this section that has to do with findings. So it's important to know that that piece of text is actually about the finding that the physician had when he actually looked at the patient. Same with the plan, it's very important to identify that that actual section has to do with what's uh, proposed for a follow-up plan, right? So you have to normalize these things into cementing concepts, not only just identify them in the text, which is not trivial. Um, obviously, some of the many things that people do in, in actual language processing, like, you know, stop word removal, you know, we have to do this kind of exercise, 
you have to tokenize and lemmatize, but I don't insist too much on this. You know, some of the most uh, complex things that you have to do when you're just parsing the text or extracting information out are things like uh, speculative scope or uh, identifying if it's about the patient or not. Because if you look for the example of this particular sentence, you know, it says no antibiotics unless blood work or clinical presentation suggests sepsis. You know, it, you really have to understand that suggests sepsis is some sort of a speculative clause. Otherwise, you know, you'll ruin everything, whatever kind of decision making you're trying to do uh, out of this, uh, out of this EMR won't, won't work. So, um, you know, with further ado, sometimes it's not sufficient to just go and uh, uh, look into this uh, simple uh, annotators. You have to go and do much more com complex things. Um, and uh, for that, we're using ontologies and, and uh, you know, to identify some of the medical terms, we use a concept annotator and we're using UMLS, which is a very large metathesaurus of uh, information in the medical domain. It's a collection of ontologies, if you want. And what the system has to do is has to uh, go and pull it up from the text, identify it in the ontology, make sure you have the list of all the sources and the unique identifiers within those, because then you can harvest the graphical re relationships between those in those ontologies. So this is what the concept annotator does. Now, many, many times it's not sufficient to just go and do this kind of processing on text. You have to go and do uh, you know, more than that, which is machine learning or some sort of classification. And for that, this is, you know, bear in mind, this is still an educational kind of uh, presentation. So um, we put together uh, an example of how a, a classification uh, would look. And in this case, we've done a very, very simple task of just identifying the gender of the document. I mean, the gender of the patient that the note is about. And uh, how do you do that? You know, many of you probably know how to do that. But for those that don't, uh, you know, this is an example of how to, how to go through that. So we took uh, 5,000 notes. We manually went and labeled 4,000 of those. And then uh, we used uh, 100 of those for uh, the rest of uh, them for testing. Uh, we've done a, uh, we're using scikit-learn here, so we're doing a hashing vectorizer on the, on the content of that uh, EMRs. And then, so we're extracting uh, features that had to do with the frequency of words within those documents. And then uh, after we did that, uh, so I'm selecting 5,000 uh, features per document, and then we're uh, doing a reduction on the feature set by doing a fit against the chi-square um, for just 2,000 of those select top to, uh, those 2,000 uh, top features. And then essentially what I'm doing is just train a bunch of classifiers in this case, and I'm picking a perceptron, a nearest neighbors, random forest, a stochastic gradient descent, and I'm trying to measure their accuracy in terms of precision and also a little bit about their performance in terms of uh, training and test time. And if you look at the results, you know, some of you would say that random forest is probably the best because it's slightly more complex. But in our case, it turned out that the perceptron was the best uh, algorithm that did the job. And you can see the accuracy is pretty good. And then, obviously, in terms of performance on training and testing, it does a very good job out of this list. Now, if you want to include this as part of a concept annotator of some kind or document classifier of some kind, all you have to do is pick all this object and then uh, use the UMO pipeline to load it and, and classify documents and add it to the list of, of uh, annotators, essentially. Okay. Okay, so, so far what we've seen and what the notebooks and the code can, can walk you through is the ability to, uh, to annotate text, right? So we can apply uh, dictionaries, we can apply patterns, we can apply, ex ex we can apply different types of expressions to get assertions out of the text. And then on top of it, usually use machine learning classifiers to understand more semantically interesting things like, you know, is the patient pregnant? Is the patient depressed? Is the patient you know, male or female, as in this example, and so on. But there's still one more component that you need which is finding a way to really enrich and be able to make sure you capture any clinically relevant concept from the text itself. And the first thing we have is, is UMLS, which is the Unified Medical Language System. And healthcare is actually very unique because for hundreds of years, many people have worked tirelessly to make sure that we categorize and build real good taxonomies of all our body parts, all of the, you know, the viruses, biology, foods, allergies, diseases, symptoms, and, and we know drugs and prescriptions as well. Uh, which is actually very unique, because if you, if you look at, at other verticals, if you track news, if you track celebrities, if you track music, if you track politics, 
you're, not, you're never going to have those ontologies and dictionaries completely up to date, uh, which is a problem because usually you're mostly interested in the things that are newer, right? So, so you want the, the, the newest nicknames of every uh, celebrity, you want the, the newest uh, scandal or the newest connection between different people you're following, whether it's in a you know, terrorist tracking setting, right, or, or a new setting. So what you need, you need a way to go and extend your, uh, and enrich your ontology. And what we applied here is uh, word to vec so that we can uh, look at clinical context, at, at clinical context, and what we're doing here is we're taking the same mimic data, but now the, the approach is different. Now the approach is to try to learn from those patients what are clinically relevant concepts uh, using Spark and NMLib, and then we go and enrich our ontology, so that we take UMLS and we add more concepts and different types of connections we have not known about before. Then uh, this enrich ontology will in turn go back to the previous stages and just enable us to get the concepts and then the classifiers on top of them to just perform better. Okay, so I'm going to show you another notebook that, again, it's available on our uh, GitHub page that will talk about this. Okay. So after we've done, after we run a, a you know, Spark process that does uh, concept extraction, all those things against the, the medical notes, um, we'll have essentially at the end a table. And it's very nice that with this table, what you can do is you can run a very simple query that will get you, uh, you know, the, the actual things that you're interested in with this, you know, very simple where clauses, all those kind of things. So um, in here, I'm selecting uh, what we call uh, assertions out of the, all the possible annotations that we extracted. These assertions are objects that have a bunch of attributes, things like if it's about the patient or not, if it's a speculative thing, if it's possible or not, those kind of things. And the actual concept itself, which is the word that exists in, uh, you know, in the ontology. And then what I'm doing with this is I'm doing a query like, you know, give me all the assertions that have to do with the patient or about the present, present condition. You can see it's a nice where clause in here where the polarity is positive, so I'm not interested in negative things, all those kind of things. And then the concept type is only a disease or a drug. And what I'm trying to do afterwards is, um, you know, after extracting all these things is run word to vec uh, on these documents and see what kind of relationships exist between this disease and drugs, if any, and if it's, you know, first of all, able to group them together in a meaningful fashion. So this is what this uh, notebook does. It's essentially asking where to get VEC uh, out of the list of most frequent disease and drugs. Give me the most relevant, if you want, for, uh, for one of those, and, and then we construct a graph structure out of it. So you can see the graph structure looks like this. Just because it's 100 nodes, it's not a very highly connected graph, but there's definitely some subgraphs and some clustering, if you want, to happening here. So let's look, let's take a peek into one of these subgraphs and see if we find some meaningful things. I hope you can see this um, even at the back of the room. So um, some of the things that I queried for are CHF, pneumonia, pleural effusion, and pneumothorax. I'm not a medical expert, but nevertheless, uh, all these three, pleural effusion, pneumothorax, and, and pneumonia are diseases that have to do with lungs. Some of them has to do with uh, air in the lung. Some of has to do with, uh, you know, some fluid in the lung. And they definitely were to vac is able just out of 100 notes to link these things together. They are similar. And uh, not only that, but it gives you also a bunch of other interesting um, words, if you want, and concepts that uh, go together with this. And all these uh, red dots are uh, those concepts that are similar. And you can see that you know, even CHF and, and pleural effusion are a little connected in pneumonia, although those are not uh, necessary you know, disease of the lung, but they also look, go, go together within the medical notes. Next in this, uh, and I'll skip very, very, very quickly, we've done the same exercise on one southern notes, and obviously the graph structure is a little more complex. There's more interesting things to look for, and we highly encourage you to go to our website, get this notebook, and play with it a little more. So those are the three main things we want to show, how you build annotations, how you build machine learned annota annotations and classifiers on top of it to get to more semantic realizations, and then how, uh, how you start applying more to work as a simpler technique, and then there are other techniques on top of it to enrich your ontology and make sure you capture not just the concept, but also all the right relationships. 
If you're looking to do this, I'll say there are a few things you need to remember. One is that all of these problems are highly, highly domain specific. It becomes very hard to use uh, things, for example, that we've done in healthcare if you, if you try to take this to financial documents or legal documents or academic documents. And that's really from the, the basic document structure to individual concepts and grammatical patterns. The other thing to remember is you do need to start with a highly scalable architecture. Uh, so here we are based on Spark, but the reality is that you, you, you'll need uh, to process and learn usually you know, millions of documents or tens of millions of documents to make progress, um, and, you know, which, which takes time. And the third thing is uh, you also need to make sure you're scalable in terms of numbers of models and classifiers you're having. Uh, because if you uh, pay attention, we, we, talk, we talked about very, very specific models to answer very, very specific questions, right? So, you know, uh, what is my gender? Am I pregnant or not? Am I at risk for a very specific disease? Uh, uh, do I have this specific allergy? Which means that in a real system, you're going to end up with hundreds of thousands of classifiers, right? That where, where for all of them, you need online measurements, you need to be able to retrain them, you need to be able to localize them to specific specialties. Uh, so in order to have a real production system, that's another part of the infrastructure that you need to build. Uh, so those are the main things we want to cover. Uh, other than that, the notebooks uh, are online. If you have any questions, please reach out to us. And otherwise, thank you for your time. Thank you.